start it. All right, Don, without further ado, I, I'm gonna let you um, take control over this presentation. I've, I've heard great things about um, you providing presentations for triangle events in the past. Really excited um, for, for what you have to present on us on a visit to Egypt. Well, thanks, Carrie. I, I know some of you, and thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I'm Don Knievel. I got a double degree from Purdue in uh, 1968. I uh, have traveled beginning in 2006 extensively in the Middle East. If anybody wants to know why that would be true, I'll certainly talk about that in the question and answer. Uh, today, we're going to be making a short trip to, uh, to Egypt. And for me, Egypt is probably the most fascinating place on earth to visit, largely because of its extraordinary long recorded history, which much of which is visible, and its connection to the religious beliefs of, of literally people around the world. Uh, the Nile River flows north, you see the Nile River, it flows north from its source in Ethiopia into the Mediterranean Delta, and as a consequence of that, Upper Egypt is in the south and Lower Egypt is in the north, which is really confusing. Uh, the areas on either side of the Nile, you sort of see the green band around the Nile, everything outside the green band are, are deserts. Egypt gets almost no rain. Uh, today, we're going to be visiting many of the places, places you see on this map, including Sinai, Cairo, Abydos, Dandera. Luxor, Edfu, Aswan, and Abu Simbel. We'll be visiting the areas in approximately the order that they were important in Egypt's history. And as a consequence of that, we will visit some of these areas more than once. Today, Egypt has about 100 million people. The population is growing at the rate of about 2% a year. When I was there in 2007, there were about 75 million people. 99% uh, of those people live in the Nile Valley and the uh, Delta that's uh, the, at the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, since the earliest days, uh, the annual flooding of the Nile has provided uh, opportunity for Egyptians to grow crops and support life along the banks of the Nile. These canals leading from the Nile were first built in antiquity and they're used today. They go back thousands of years. Uh, these farmers uh, are burning their fields in preparation for the new crop. That's been the traditional way of preparing for the new crop. Uh, they don't really worry much about the pollution in the, in the Nile Valley. Uh, most of the people not living in the Nile Valley are people called Bedouins. Uh, some Bedouins live in the desert, have no permanent home. They're often considered stateless people, but other Bedouins live in permanent villages in the desert, sometimes built for them by the government. This village is in the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, which of Butch Israel we'll talk a little bit more about later. When uh, when most people think about Egypt, I think the first thing to think about are the pyramids of Giza, which surprising to many people is just outside Cairo. Some people have just ascribed magical properties to the pyramidal shape and imagine some perhaps extraterrestrial inspiration. Uh, but the reality of the pyramids uh, is much more down to earth. Belief in a life after death originally led the Egyptians to bury at least their most important dead and their possessions in underground tombs carved into the bedrock with the structures above the tomb, stone structures above the tombs called mastabas. This is a mastaba built in about uh, 2600 BC made of stone. In about uh, 2600 BC, and I want you to sort of think about how long ago that's really been, that's 4,600 years ago, uh, an Egyptian architect named Mobotech place six mastabas on top of each other as the burial place for a pharaoh named Dozier. The result was this famous step pyramid on the right, built in the area of uh, Saqqara, which is near Cairo. So that's the first thing we can identify in Egypt uh, as having a pyramidal shape. It was the, uh, the so-called step pyramid. After the construction of the step pyramid, pyramid building in Egypt progressed rapidly. The, uh, the pyramid on the left is called the Bent Pyramid. Uh, Pharaoh Seneferu, one of the greatest of all Egyptian pharaohs, built it shortly after the Step Pyramid. He said, we should have a pyramid now that we know about pyramids that went straight sides. Uh, so unlike the Step Pyramid, this one had straight sides and it's considered the first true pyramid. In addition, unlike the Mastabas and the Step Pyramid, the burial chamber was inside this, this pyramid and not under it. Because of this, the pyramid had a hollow space which proved difficult to accomplish without leading to a collapse of the entire structure. And as a consequence of that, the angle of the bent pyramid was changed during construction because of concerns about a collapse. And that's why it's called the bent pyramid. You can see the angle actually of, 
a, a changing. Seneferu then built a pyramid on the right, which is called the Red Pyramid. It has the shallow angle of the top section of the Barent Pyramid about 43 degrees. These are the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau. You can see the city of Cairo in the background. The one to the left is the oldest, built by King Kifu, the son, Khufu, the son of Sneferu in about 2500 BC. For those of you who are sort of keeping track of years, this is about 1300 years before the time of the biblical exodus. The uh, pyramid on the left is also the tallest, although the one in the middle looks taller because it's built on higher ground. The second pyramid is built by King Khafre, the son of Khufu. The third pyramid, which is much smaller, was built by Khafre's son, Menachor. And as you see, the, the, and we'll see later, the pyramid building skills peaked at the very beginning. Uh, you, you might think that they have progression as, as they go. So, the, so the, the, the Grand Pyramid of Khufu is the largest of all. This is that pyramid up close, uh, the Pyramid of Khufu. Uh, the smaller pyramids are for his wives. Each of Khufu's pyramids is, uh, each side of Khufu's pyramid is more than 750 feet long. And it contains about 3 million stone blocks. Some of the blocks were made of granite, transported from Aswan 500 miles to the south. The base of this pyramid varies from a perfect square by only two inches and is aligned with true north, not magnetic north, to within less than a tenth of a degree. What's amazing is that the time of the Great Pyramids of Giza, the Egyptians had not invented the wheel. No one is certain about how these stones were actually put into position, but most theories allow the use of earthen ramps along which the stones were dragged to high levels and then the ramp removed. Contrary to public opinion, the pyramids were not built by slaves, but by workers paid by the government, probably farmers in the off season. This pit near Khufu's pyramid was opened in 1954. It contained more than 1,200 pieces of well-preserved wood that had once been a boat. This is the reconstructed boat that had been buried, perhaps for King Khufu to use in his afterlife. It may have also been used as a part of his burial ceremony. Many people who visited the pyramids come back and remark that they were not as big as they'd imagined. I think that's because they have taken on a larger than life appearance and people seeing them in, in person eliminates the perception of unreality. But no matter what the impression, the pyramids of Khufu and his son are enormous on any scale. Each covers an area of more than 13 acres. Some of the individual stone blocks weigh 80 tons and the stones were cut at a time that the Egyptians had only stone and copper tools and had not yet been in the possession of iron. In 1840, David Roberts, a Scottish artist, went to Egypt and returned with many drawings of what he found. This is his famous drawing of a sandstorm near the Pyramid of Khafre with the Great Sphinx. The body was covered with sand, creating the appearance of a disembodied head. And that may be how you all think of the Sphinx, as simply a disembodied head. This is the Great Sphinx today, uncovered, with the Pyramid of Khafre on the left and the Pyramid of Khufu on the right. Although the Great Sphinx is often pictured to suggest that it's right next to the pyramids, it's actually more than a mile away from them. Carved in the limestone quarry from which the stones of the Great Pyramid were mined, the body is 240 feet long and the top of the head is 66 feet above the floor. It's the largest statue in the world carved from a single piece of stone. The Great Sphinx is actually the human head on the body of a lion, a popular Egyptian motif. The most popular theory is that the Sphinx honors the Pharaoh Khafre, whose pyramid is nearby. Giza guides sometimes claim that the nose was blown off by cannonballs, a cannonball shot by Napoleon's forces, but sketches made before the birth of Napoleon show the Sphinx without his nose. Pyramid building began to decline after the Great Pyramids on Giza and never again reached that level. This is the Pyramid of Yusufov, built at Saqqara after the Giza Pyramids, as you can see it today, it's just mostly rubble. This is the Pyramid of Pharaoh Teti, also built at Saqqara in about 2300 BC. 
It is little more than a squared pile of rubble covered with veneer of limestone sheets. They'd forgotten how to build pyramids with solid blocks. Thieves long ago removed the exterior stones and most of the grave goods, but they left behind in this structure so-called pyramid texts on the walls of the burial chamber that reflected Egyptian beliefs about life after death and are considered the world's oldest, oldest religious writings. Soon after the reign of King Teddy and the absence of the ability to build pyramids, the government of Egypt collapsed, ending the so-called Old Kingdom. Egypt then entered the first intermediate period in which very little is known because very few records were kept. After about 200 years, the rule of the pharaohs was restored, giving rise to the so-called Middle Kingdom, which also collapsed when Egypt was invaded by the Hyksos in about 1650 BC. So we have periods of high civilization followed by periods of, of, of very little writing, followed by another period, and then followed by another collapse. And finally, in about 1550 BC, the Egyptian pharaohs regained control and restored again the rule of the pharaohs. This gave rise to the so-called New Kingdom. Most of the pharaohs that we hear about are New Kingdom pharaohs. And perhaps because of the fear of tomb robbers, or perhaps because they'd forgotten how to build them, the pharaohs of the New Kingdom did not build pyramids. Instead, they built tombs carved deep into the limestone in the so-called Valley of the Kings. And you'll see why they chose this particular limestone valley, because if you look to the formation at the left, it reminds them of the pyramid. That pyramid-like structure is probably one of the reasons why the New Kingdom pharaohs decided to use this valley as their burial ground. The Valley of the Kings is near the ancient city of Thebes, where the New Kingdom pharaohs established their religious capital. Today, that city is called Luxor, and so the Valley of the Kings uh, is now near Luxor. So far, 63 tombs have been found in the Valley of the Kings. The original occupants of many of them had still not been determined. However, many of the famous kings of the New Kingdom, pharaohs of the New Kingdom, were buried here. The intact tomb, I'm sure you heard about this, the intact tomb of Tutankhamun, so-called King Tut, was found here in 1922 by Howard Carter and is shown on the map as KV-62, the only tomb that was found with its long uh, uh, intact. Today, all of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings are open to visitors. By far, the most impressive is the tomb of Seti I, who we'll talk more about later. His magnificently decorated tomb is, <clears throat> is open to the public for an extra fee of about $100. When Egyptians began entombing pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings, they built a town about two miles away on the other side of the mountain for the tomb builders and their families. This town was originally named the Place of the Truth, it was founded in about 1500 BC, and lasted until the burial in the Valley of the Kings ended about 400 years later. At its peak, this town, now known as Daryl Medina, included more than 100 four or five bedroom stone houses for the workers of the Valley of the Kings. During their time off, these workers constructed chapels and tombs for themselves and their families. And Daryl Medina, also known as the Valley of the Workers, includes some of the most finely decorated tombs in Egypt because they were carved by the tomb builders. Near the entrance to the Valley of the Kings, is this magnificent 3,500 year old building that even today is considered a model for adapting a building to its, building to its surroundings. It is the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, the daughter of Tutmosis I, who was the first pharaoh entombed in the Valley of the Kings. After a brief reign, as the, excuse me, after a brief stint as regent for a young male pharaoh, Hatshepsut declared herself pharaoh in 1479 BC, the first female Egyptian pharaoh. Hatshepsut expanded a famous temple complex near the modern city of Luxor, then the city of Thebes. This complex was named Karnak, was begun in about 2000 BC and eventually covered more than a thousand acres, making, the world's, making it the world's second largest religious site. Hatshepsut erected this obelisk, obelisk in front of a temple in Karnak. 
The obelisk gently sloping sides, and at the time a gold-plated pyramid at the top, symbolized the path of sun rays streaming toward the earth, representing the connections between the sun god, Amon, and the temple. To reflect the eternal nature of these connections, Egyptians carved their obelisk from single, a single piece of granite, often weighing hundreds of tons. Originally, there were two obelisks in front of every temple, but many were taken to Europe, beginning first with the Romans. One obelisk from an Egyptian temple is now in front of St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, St. Peter's Cath Basilica in Rome, topped by a Christian cross. The most suitable granite quarry for obelisks was along the Nile River in Aswan, about 150 miles south of Luxor, where many of the temples were located. Granite outcroppings called a cataract, as you can see here, obstruct the flow of the river and once formed the southern boundary of Egypt. The structures about halfway up the hill are tombs. The structure at the top of the hill is the mausoleum of Aga Khan III, who died in 1957 after being president of the League of Nations. His son Ali Khan uh, married Rita Hayward. This famous unfinished obelisk in a quarry near As As uh, Juan was abandoned when a crack was discovered in the granite, making it useless for its intended purpose. It is still not entirely clear how these obelisks were removed from the quarry, transported 150 miles down river, and erected at the temple entrances. In about 1450 BC, Pharaoh Tutmosis III, who ruled just after Hatshepsut, built an artificial lake lined with stone, 420 feet long by 250 feet wide, just south of the main temple of Amun in the Karnak complex. Egyptian priests living in special quarters south of this sacred lake used the lake to purify themselves before performing religious rituals in the temples of Amun. Many scholars believe that the purification rituals in this lake, this sacred lake, are echoed in Jewish mikvahs, Christian bapt baptismal fonts, and Muslim ablution pools. Hatshepsut's male successors tried to eliminate any evidence her, of her existence including obliterating her image at Karnak. They believed that by erasing her image, they would also destroy her existence in the afterlife. As a result of this, Hatshepsut was unknown until the 20th century. One of the most impressive structures in the Karnak complex is the hypostyle hall, begun by Pharaoh Seti I, one of the most important pharaohs in the New Kingdom in about 1300 BC. The hall occupies 1.2 acres, making it the largest such structure in the world. The hypostyle hall includes 134 stone columns arranged in 16 rows. Two taller rows in the middle, each includes eight, uh, six 80 foot high columns, each having a diameter of 10 feet. All the columns in the surrounding walls are covered with hieroglyphic reliefs, honoring the important god of moon, the Pharaoh Seti the first and Pharaoh Ramses the second Seti's son. A long gaunt wooden roof rested on stone littles extending between the columns. Although Egyptian architects had used arches over doorways, they never learned to build domes or arches to support roofs. In about 1280 BC, Seti the first built a temple on the west bank of the Nile a place called Abydos to honor himself and a triad of gods, Osiris, Iris, Isis, and Horus. This is the Hall of Commons in the Abydos complex. This carving at Abydos, this wall carving, was made during the reign of Seti I. This scene is so-called positive relief, in which the scene comes out from the wall requiring that everything else be carved away. This shows Seti I on the right, offering water and insects to a mummified Osiris, the god of the dead, and his son Horus. This scene at Abydos with the original coloring shows Seti I holding the crook and flail that showed his legitimacy. He is receiving the key of life, 
called the Ankh from the god Thoth. Early Egyptian Christians used this same symbol as a representation of the cross of Jesus, the key of life. This is another picture of Seti I at Abydos. Notice a remarkable detail in the clothing and in the club in his left hand. This Abydos scene was completed during the reign of Ramses II, the son of Seti I. It shows Ramses II himself offering gifts to Osiris with his wife Isis and son Horus looking on. But if you look at this, you'll see the relief is not as fine as the reliefs of Seti I. It is negative relief in which the desired scene is carved into the wall. Some people see parallels between this scene and the Christian triad of God the Father, Mary, and Jesus, which Muslims incorrectly believe is the Christian Trinity, which may derive from, the, from this scene. Abydos also includes a famous scene of Osiris, the god of the dead, being restored to life by Horus, his son, and Isis, his wife. According to the story, Osiris had lost an important part of his anatomy, which was replaced by a metal prosthesis, and he then was resurrected. This wall at, on the wall, this uh, wall at Abydos, so Seti I and his son, Ramses II, and also contains a unique list of earlier pharaohs. It omits Hatshepsut and omits Tutankhamun, King Tut, who died at 19 after a short reign. The fact that Tutankhamun was unknown may have kept grave robbers away from his tomb. Ramses II, called Ramses the Great by history, is the pharaoh most often associated with the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Ramses lived for 90 years and ruled Egypt for 66. Throughout his reign, he built enormous monuments to himself. This colossal statue of Ramses II built to his instructions is now in a special enclosure near Memphis, the first capital of Egypt. The statue is almost 34 feet tall without its missing lower legs and feet. Near the modern city of Lexor, then Thebes, Ramses built the Ramesseum, a memorial temple to himself, honoring his immortal connection with Ra, his namesake, the sun god, Ram disease. It was the largest building project in the world since the Great Pyramids 1500 years earlier. Ramses also rebuilt an existing temple at Lexor, Luxor, he placed large statues of himself at the entrance so everyone would make the connection between him and the worship inside. You can see the single obelisk now in front of the temple. The other one is now in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. The most impressive monument Ramses, Ramses built to himself is at Abu, uh, Abu Simbel, then at the southern edge of his kingdom, and now a short plane ride from Aswan. Skilled workers literally hollowed out a small mountain to contain to create a multi-room temple honoring Ramses and his favorite wife Nefertari, and an implicit warning to outsiders not to even consider invading a kingdom with such a powerful ruler. To make sure everyone got the message, four 65-foot-tall cedar statues of Ramses were cut from the mountain at the temple's entrance. At his feet are carved images of his captives, and between his legs are statues of some of his 100 or so children. Just inside the hall are statues honoring Ramsey's military exploits. Eight columns cut from the rock show Ramsey's as the god Osiris. Today, the water of Lake Nasser, formed in the Nile River by the Aswan High Dam, nearly covers the mountains at Abu Simbel in which Ramses carved his temples. To save the temples, beginning in 1964, workers cut the temples, statues the surrounding rock into more than 10,000 blocks, some weighing 30 tons. They moved the numbered blocks to a site 200 feet higher and 600 feet further from the Nile and reassembled them using a metal dome for support, even faithfully recreating the falling Ramses statue in the entrance. 
Nefertiti, the favorite wife of Ramses II, was entombed in the Valley of the Queens. It was established near the Valley of the Kings at the beginning of the New Kingdom to hold the wives of pharaohs. This inscription on the pylon wall of the Temple at Karnak sets out the terms of a peace treaty between Egypt, led by Ramses II, and the Hittites. They fought a major battle in the area now called Syria in about 1250 BC, and neither side could defeat the other. This wall includes one of the first known treaties between countries and is duplicated in cuneiform script written by the Hittites. The text of this treaty is so important that there's a replica of it at the United Nations in New York. This is the entrance gate or pylon at a temple called Menenet Habu, built as a memorial temple for the Pharaoh Ramses III in about 1150 BC. Pharaohs were considered gods and, worshiped in, and were worshiped in temples by their subjects. This is a closer view of the left side of the pylon. It shows Ramses III holding enemies with his left hand and getting ready to smite them with the club in his right hand. He's doing this in front of the god Amun-Ra on the right. This is a variation on a very common site on the pylons and outer walls of Egyptian temples. Only the pharaohs and the gods differ. This wall at Menenat Habu depicts in pictures and hieroglyphs Ramses III defeating the so called Sea Peoples. They're mysterious people who entered Egypt and the area on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea from areas around Greece in about 1150 BC. Much of what is known about the Sea People in Egypt is based on this story, wall, story on the wall at Medinat Habu. Scholars believe that the Philistines, who fought with the Israelites at the time of King David were related to these sea people. Another wall at Medinat Habu may help explain the origins of circumcision. As you can see here, Egyptian soldiers removed the phalluses of killed enemies and brought them to the Pharaoh. They laid them at the feet of the Pharaoh who compensated the soldiers based on the size of their pile. As is shown in this ancient drawings, Egyptians have practiced circumcision since before 2000 BC. One theory is that, that Egypt required soldiers to be circumcised to prevent them from cheating by bringing back the disembodied, the dismembered members of dead Egyptians instead of enemy soldiers. This scene on a wall at the Karnak Temple from the time of Pharaoh Sheshonk, ruled in about 925 BC, has allowed scholars to put dates on the reign of early biblical kings. This drawing shows a god of moon delivering about 150 captured cities to Sheshonk. Scholars recognize <clears throat> that the Karnak Wall <clears throat> memorializes <clears throat> excuse me, an Egyptian campaign against the, quote, fortified cities of Judah, the Bible says succeeded because Rehoboam had abandoned the laws of Yahweh, the God of Moses. The Bible identifies the conquering pharaoh Shishak, which scholars say is another name for Shishonk, and that identity allowed scholars to synchronize the dates of the king of Judah with those of Egypt and conclude that Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and Shishak ruled in about 925 BC, and from that we can determine the, the time period of Solomon, and then from that, David. When Alexander the Great conquered Egypt in 332 BC, he was proclaimed Pharaoh and considered himself a god. After Alexander's death in Babylon in 323 BC, his general continued the idea of becoming Pharaoh Ptolemy I. His son Ptolemy II built the temple to Isis, the goddess Isis on Philly Island in the Nile River near Aswan. This temple, mimicking much older temples, showed Ptolemy II among the Egyptian gods. The temple at Philae eventually had two pylons or entrance gates. A later pharaoh could publish his own accomplishments on a pylon without destroying that one built by his earlier pharaohs. He simply built another one. The Karnak temple complex has 10 pylons. The temple of Edfu, built by Greek pharaohs beginning in the third century BC to honor Horus, the falcon god of the sky, is the best preserved of all Egyptian temples. 
you can see a small statue of Horus, the hawk god, just to the left of the entrance. Greek artisans attempted to duplicate the wall art of earlier temples with increased sensuality. This scene inside the temple of Edfu shows the traditional Egyptian gods. You see Horus, the hawk god to the right, Isis in the middle. Following the model of much earlier temples, a small statue of Horus resided in a niche in the temple's Holy of Holies, accessible only by the Pharaoh and the high priest. Priests occasionally transported the god statue away from the temple in an ark or a box, resting in a miniature boat carried on two poles. A replica of the ark displayed in the Holy of Holies is based on a wall relief. The wall relief shows two bird-like creatures facing each other above the ark, their wings extended over the seat on which the god Horus sat. According to the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant, enthroning the invisible Jewish God, was carried on two poles attached by rings to the base. The Ark incorporated two cherubim facing each other, their wings extended over the mercy seat from which God spoke. It seems likely that the Israelites, as they left Egypt, carried their invisible God in an Ark similar to the ones with which they were familiar from Egyptian gods. In about 14. 100 BC, Pharaoh Tutmosis III had erected a temple overlooking the Nile River about 31 miles north of Aswan for worshiping the god Sobek, usually shown with a crocodile head. By the second century BC, the temple near Komobo had fallen into ruins, so Ptolemy Pharaoh the sixth Philometer, who began reigning about 180 BC, believed Sobek deserved a new temple. Not wanting to offend Sobek's rival, the falcon-headed Horus, Ptolemy built a limestone temple featuring two identical side-by-side -side sections. One side is devoted to Sobek, the uh, crocodile, and the other to Horus, the hawk. This nilometer at Kamombo showed the height of the Nile. When the Romans took control of Egypt, they modified the Kamombo temple. One relief includes representations of Roman scalpels, forceps, scissors, catheters, bone saws, medicine bottles, specula, suction cups, and dental tools. They're assembled between a basin and a goddess on a birthing stool. In about 55 BC, Pharaoh Ptolemy XII began erecting a temple to Hawthor, the Egyptian goddess of fertility and beauty on the side of the earlier temples near the town of Dandera, 37 miles north of Luxor. The work relief cards from the temples were apparently intended to represent Ptolemy the 12th, but he died before the images were identified. Ptolemy the 12th was succeeded in 51 BC by his daughter, <clears throat> excuse me, Cleopatra the 7th, who charmed her Egyptian subjects by learning the Egyptian language. She herself was Greek. Cleopatra displayed other charms while Julius, Julius Caesar visited Egypt in 48 BC. She had herself delivered to him in a rug, leading nine months later to a son nicknamed Caesarean, meaning little Caesar. Caesarean, Caesarean, meaning little Caesar. Cleopatra added her deified image to the rear wall of the Dandera temple, depicting herself as Hawthor, accompanied her son, her chosen successor, pictured as Pharaoh. Her plan failed and Rome took control of Egypt when she died in 30 BC. This is one of the very few surviving images of Cleopatra, but probably doesn't look much like her. Like their Greek predecessors, the Roman emperors considered themselves God. They thought the Greeks had a pretty good idea. In about 100 AD, Emperor Trajan added to the Temple of Philae, a 14 column pavilion that served as a river ent entrance to the temple and a place for storing the boat on which the statue of Isis traveled on the Nile. The walls of what is often called Trajan's bed were decorated with images of Trojan, tr excuse me, Trajan, offering incense to Isis and other Egyptian gods. Like the temples at Abu Simbel, the temple at Philae, including Trajan's bed, was, were cut apart and moved to higher ground on Agicola Island when the Aswan Dam flooded the original site. 
In 2004, the Egyptian Space Agency launched the Rosetta spacecraft toward a comet. The lander was named Philae in honor of the temple. And the name of the 2014 landing spot of the, on the comet determined by public vote was named Agikola, the current location of the Philae temple in Trajan bed. So it has some current significance. In the sixth century BC, the Persians then in control of Egypt had erected a fortress just east of the Nile River where an ancient canal led to the Red Sea. A town developed around the fortress called Babylon for reasons that are not entirely clear. When the Romans gained control of the area in about 30 BC, they built an expensive brick and stone fortress near the river, featuring multiple bastions around the perimeter. The Babylon fortress was connected to the Nile by a drawbridge supported by two circular towers each 108 feet in diameter. Christianity came early to Egypt. Christians originally worshiped in the temples of the Egyptian gods, which they modified to fit their purposes. These statues at Karnak were made into a cross. After Emperor Constantine did make Christianity legal in the Roman Empire in about 312 AD, he sent his mother Helena to the Middle East to determine where events in the Bible had occurred. Helena returned, claiming she had found the cave in Bethlehem where Jesus was born, the spot in Jerusalem where he was crucified, and the still living bush in Egypt where Moses met God. Constantine ordered a chapel to be built around Helena's bush. In sixth century, Emperor Justinian surrounded the chapel in his famous bush with St. Catherine's Monastery, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Today, it includes very early manuscripts of the New Testament, and the area above the monastery is the traditional Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. You can see it off to the right. Some of the local Bedouins operate camel rides for visitors to Mount Sinai. For fee, they will take you to the top of the mountain on the back of a camel. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus fled to Egypt to escape from King Herod after he gave orders to kill all babies in the area of Bethlehem under the age of two years of age. That visit to Egypt is reflected in this stained glass window in a Cairo church. You can see the pyramids on the right. This scene is much more popular in churches in Egypt than in this, the scene of a baby Jesus in a manger, which of course happened in Israel and not in Egypt. The account in the book of Matthew about the sojourn of the Holy Family gives no details about the trip. However, the Egyptians have developed elaborate details about where the Holy Family went, where they stayed when they were in Egypt. This map in a church in Cairo shows the, the route and the sites. You can see the route coming toward the Mediterranean from the east and then going south along the Nile all the way to Aswan, where there had been a Jewish colony since the days of the Babylonian exile of the Jews. According to the Coptic Christian Church, this route and the sites along it were revealed to an official in the church in a dream at about 500 AD. This is stairs is in a church in Mahdi, a prosperous suburb of Cairo. It leads down to an area along the Nile where the Holy Family is said to have stepped into a boat. In 640 AD, Christian defenders of the Babylon Fortress held out for six months before being captured by Muslim invaders. After the Muslims gained control of Egypt, they allowed Christians to build churches within the fortress walls. The famous hanging church built in the seventh century is suspended between the south gate towers of the fortress. The interior of the hanging church has been remodeled repeatedly, but one of its most distinctive original features remains. The vaulted wooden ceiling reportedly suggests an inverted Noah's Ark. The circular church of St. George was built in the 10th century over the foundation of the northern bridge tower of the original Babylon fortress. Six other churches, a convent and the Coptic Museum are now all located within the perimeter of the former fortress, designated Coptic Cairo for the Egyptian Christians who still worship in the area. The city of Cairo is not an ancient city. It was developed uh, in the ninth century around the, uh, the fortress of Babylon. In 1175, Saladin became the, sultan, the first sultan of Egypt and Syria and made Cairo his capital. To protect against the Crusaders, he built a fortress around Cairo and a surrounding town. From this citadel, Saladin launched his, the expedition that recaptured Jerusalem from the Crusaders. 
By the 14th century, Cairo was at the center of the Islamic world. This mosque, modeled in the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, was begun in the early 19th century. The citadel in Cairo was the administrative center of Cairo until the late 19th century. This is the Nazareth Synagogue, the oldest synagogue in Egypt, located among the churches in, in the ancient area just east of the Nile River. The synagogue became the repository for documents of all kinds, including the word God, and therefore could not be destroyed under Jewish law. When the synagogue was restored in the 1890s, builders discovered more than 250,000 documents dating from the 9th century, including letters written by Maimonides, the great Jewish philosopher who lived nearby after being forced from his home in Cordoba, Spain. This cache of documents found in this building is the world's largest collection of medieval documents and provide new information about the life, life and teaching of Maimonides. Cairo has a current population of about nine and a half million. If you look carefully on the right, you can see the pyramids. But the uh, nine million or so in the surrounding area of metropolitan Cairo is among the largest, most crowded areas in the world. On the north side of Cairo is a cemetery begun in medieval times. This is a mausoleum on the edge of that cemetery built for a sultan. This is the view from inside the mausoleum. It is in the Mudajar, Mudahar style made popular in Spain and Morocco. Some of you have been to Spain and Morocco have seen this style of architecture. This is a, there's a minaret <clears throat> building connection with the mausoleum that anyone can climb. From the top, you can see the enormous cemetery and the domes of other mausoleums. But you can also see houses built among the mausoleums and tombs. This is the so-called city of the dead. Today, up to a million people live in and around the tombs, some in the tombs themselves and others in apartments built by the government. Children play amidst the graves while women hang their laundry on ropes strung from one mausoleum to the next. Lacking a better solution for this population, the government has run electric wires and provided water to some of the tombs. These children are riding their bikes on a street in the city of the dead. Notice the little girl's shirt, it says, having a bad day. Some children are third generation, or third generation living in Cairo's tombs and have no other place to consider home. Vendors set up at the entrance to the cemetery selling food and other essentials. Like other Middle Eastern cities, Cairo includes a chaotic central market. This shop proudly proclaims that its owner speaks Spanish. Some of the items would fit right in an American flea market. On the day I was there, the meat market was a little slow. The market is also a place to relax and have a smoke. More than 90% of the people living in Egypt are Muslim who are expected to pray five times a day and go to the mosque on Friday for prayers. This is inside one of the largest and oldest mosques in Cairo. This is another mosque near Cairo's Bazaar. These silver items are actually large umbrellas made of aluminum. This is the same mosque during Friday prayers. You can see the umbrellas are now open to shade the people outside because there's not enough room inside. Many people dress up for Friday prayers. This is an entire family near the mosque. There's another couple coming to prayers. I found the Egyptian people to be very friendly and open and perfectly happy to talk and have their pictures taken. Despite the pervasive presence of Islam, Egypt is not particularly conservative socially, at least compared to other Islamic countries in the region. This is a display in Cairo's main bazaar. Although banned in some public places, alcohol is freely available in many hotels and restaurants. This is Cairo's famous Egyptian museum, which features the treasures from the tomb of, of Tutankhamun and the mummies of some of Egypt's most important pharaohs, including Ramses II. It and some of its items were damaged, uh, damaged during the Civil War of 2011, which began in the square just in front of this museum. A new museum containing the contents of the existing museum and the thousands of other items is being built near the pyramid. It's gonna be called the Grand Egyptian Museum. 
Uh, recently, there's a parade of pharaohs to take the mummies out of this museum. It was supposed to open last year, and it's still way behind schedule, but it should open uh, sometime in 2021. Uh, we're going to end the uh, visit to Egypt at the old Cataract Hotel in Aswan, one of Egypt's most popular hotels. It's where Agatha Christie uh, wrote the Death on the Nile. It was completed the Death on the Nile. This hotel serves, still serves high tea from a pavilion overlooking the, uh, overlooking the Nile. Well, there's a lot of Egypt that we've covered. And there's also a lot of Egypt we haven't covered. Uh, so if you want more information about some of the places we visited and some of the places we didn't, you can go to my website, donkennebel.com articles. There's many, many articles about Egypt uh, arranged uh, by, by country. And now if you want, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. I think we have about 10 more minutes and any questions, anybody, uh, comments, thoughts, be happy to try to answer them all. Shut the screen down if you, if you, uh, again, donkenable.com articles will get you all my articles. Okay. Hey, Don, this is, Don, this is John. Hey, I, Hi, John. I had, I had heard at one, I had heard at one time the thought that the Sphinx may be considerably older than the pyramids, but it sounds like from what you said that they're about the same age, which any well, thoughts we, on that? Yeah, I, it, they're the same age. They're, the, the quarry was where the, 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 rock, the, the rocks were, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the, of the stone from the pyramids was taken. And so once they had most of that stone out, they just took the remainder and just carved that statue. It's in, it, or that, that Sphinx. It's in front of about a mile away from the tomb of Khafre. Right. So most, most people think it was really part of, the, of, of his memorial. Okay. That's yeah, thanks. That, I think, John, that's the most common, the most common wisdom that it was, that it was about, it's about simultaneous with the tomb, with the uh, uh, pyramid of Khafre. Yeah, I, I think the comments were more, you know, the, I guess assigning a more mystic nature to the uh, to the Sphinx, and that was the. Yeah, I think I think you know the Sphinx is just head, with just a head, and the sand's covering it up to his neck. You can think all kinds of things about what this signifies, but when yeah. they finally uncover and you see that it's just a, it's a body of a lamb and the head of a of a of a, of a king, uh, it matches all the Sphinxes that are common all throughout Europe. You can see uh, Egypt. You can see many many Sphinxes smaller than that one, obviously, but representing different kings of the era. So yes, that, that's that's my that's my my understanding of it, John. Thanks for that. Thanks, sir. Hey, good evening, uh, Don. This is Robert Reynolds, uh, Purdue uh, 2000. I just wanted to ask, you said you'd been in the uh, Middle East and Egypt a lot. Uh, what brought you over there? What sparked your interest in this? I went to Israel in 2006. Uh, and when there got a sense that I didn't know a lot about the Middle East, had an opportunity to go to Egypt in 2007, got the sense that I didn't know even more about the Middle East and started going back, uh, went to Syria, went to, to Jordan, uh, eventually ended up in Morocco and uh, Turkey and places like that, just to get a better understanding of the people and their religions. And so one of the things I've been doing in the meantime is doing a lot of speaking about religions of the world and the intersections of various religions. But it was really curiosity sparked by, by being in Israel and thinking there's a lot of things that I really don't understand. Uh, well, that's so great. Was, that was a great presentation, Don, for sure. You have like, a lot of good I was, knowledge. I was, in, I was in Syria in the fall of two, uh, November of 2010. The, the outbreak of civil war in Syria was only about five months after that. And so I was one of the last Americans to be in Syria. Hey, Don, I have a, I have a question for you. So um, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to travel to Egypt once um, the world gets back to normal. Yep. Curious, how long do you think someone needs to go for to really take it in? And, and would you recommend staying at, you know, more local things? Or did you find that just going to like the chains was better? Just any sort of like advice from your expertise? I, I will tell you that I went with a group that I have gone with <clears throat> many places, including Syria, Cuba, Spain, Morocco. I, I think if you want to see Egypt, you need to go with somebody. You need to go with somebody who can tell you what you're seeing. Uh, and you, you may have seen the hotel near the beginning where there, there were pyramids in the background. That's the Mina house in Cairo. They were able to get reservations there. Uh, they were able to get us tours on the, uh, boat tours on the, I need to think, if you try to do it on your own, you're going to miss an awful lot of what's there. Uh, so I would recommend if you want to go, I, I recommend about 10 days, uh, that, that can take you, uh, most of the places in Egypt, uh, Alexandria is a place a lot of people want to go, but there's nothing to see in Alexandria. Some people say it's the most famous place where there's nothing to see. Uh, Alexandria is destroyed by floods and fires. So there's nothing to see there. 
Uh, there's plenty of things to see around Cairo and around Luxor and then, and then further north at Aswan. So it's going to take you a while. Great. Thank you. Let me add my two. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, we were there probably 30 years, 40 years ago. I still remember it as a most uh, fantastic tour. We were on a tour. Um, we did stay uh, about a week later after the tour. We also went to Israel and Jordan before this tour and we flew between uh, uh, to uh, Cairo. Um, the, I, I was, I did, I, I, I assume you showed the uh, pyramids. Uh, I vividly remember the pyramids going inside them. I, I don't know if they still do that, but we crawled all the way inside. It's, it's a fantastic trip. But I would expect, I would de definitely recommend the tour. Uh, they're not terribly uh, cheap. Uh, you can always add a few days before or after the tour if you want to see more. But uh, I, I, Abel Simba was spectacular. We were there uh, when the sun came up. It's a sun, it's, a, it's, it's aligned toward the sun ri rising. If you're inside, the sun will go all the way back to the very end of the uh, monument uh, at a certain times of the year. Yep. Um, I, I don't want to speak too much about my accent. Uh, one thing, I, I, again, you mentioned that that whole mountain you saw in your picture is Ooh. all fake. It's all fake. It's built, fake. it's built on it's built on a metal superstructure. Right. Yeah. And you can go inside it. There's you a go door. Inside it. You can go inside it. Absolutely. You can go inside it. It, 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 when you go inside, you cannot believe what this what they did to get this to save this. It was a UNESCO. It was a UNESCO project. The UNESCO yes. did this, and they otherwise the Abu Simbel is going to be flooded, and so they decided to we just move the mountain. In effect, they, 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 they cut the block up and the solid block, and they moved them all. Yep, they sure really did. remarkable. You, you stand in front of it, and you can't believe it. Right. Anything else? Other questions? We got two, three minutes. Hey, Don, any, any any safety concerns you think now traveling there? You know, John, I, I'm asked that question every place I go, and the answer is, well, you can get hit on the way to the airport and a, by by something. Uh, right. There, so far as I know, there are no safety issues right now in Egypt. There's uh, the, the people that took me to Egypt, a group called Tours of the uh, Journeys of the Mind out of Chicago, was planning a trip for this fall, uh, and they plan to have New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve, one of those eves, in the Luxor Pyramid, at the Luxor Temple. Uh, so I think there's most people now think it's pretty safe to go to Egypt. Egypt has a huge stake in making you safe. I mean, they, when I was there, a, an armed guard was with us all the time. They don't want to have American tourists harmed. And so uh, they, they make sure you're protected. 40 years ago, no, yeah. I'm sorry? 40 years ago, they had the same problem. They had explosions there. Yeah. So this is nothing new. This is Ted. I'll just add to it. My cousin, our uh, brother-in-law just got back from Egypt, was over there for about a week. So, and the picture showed that it looked like he didn't have any problems. What did he think of it? Oh, he loved it. I mean, the pictures were fabulous. And uh, he just, he didn't do a group tour. He, uh, kind of, it was over quick and such, but uh, uh, quite a trip. I've done a lot in Saudi Arabia and um, Israel. And I agree with your comment. You need somebody to help walk you around. Or you, uh, it's like wandering around New York City. You'll get lost and overwhelmed real quick. Well, the other thing is, if you go into a temple, you know what you're looking at. If you if you go into an Egyptologist, they'll tell you what you're looking at. I wouldn't have known Cyrus or, excuse me, Asedi from Ramses or Ramses II, Ramses III, unless somebody is pointing out this is what you're looking at. Uh, and so I think it's essential to have somebody go along with you, at least a guide. Anything else anyone wants to comment about? Well, Kerry, thanks for letting me do this. Triangles, thanks for joining me. This was awesome. Thank you. Don, thank you so much. Thank you guys for, for tuning in, asking questions. Um, Don's linked his, uh, his website there on the screen if you guys are, are looking to, to look back at anything um, that he may have presented on. Don, thank you so much uh, for, for uh, agreeing to, to come on tonight and have a chat with us. And I hope everyone enjoyed um, taking a little visit to Egypt. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Don. Thanks, Don. It was great. Thanks.